When the Buddha talks about focusing on feelings as a frame of reference, he talks about two main kinds. There's what he calls feelings of the flesh and feelings not of the flesh. And the distinction doesn't have to do with the difference between physical and mental feelings. Feelings of the flesh can be physical or mental, feelings not of the flesh can be physical or mental. The difference lies in where they come from, the issues that they're related to. Feelings of the flesh refer to sense of pleasure or pain or neither pleasure nor pain that you feel when you get either meet with things that you like in terms of sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations. Those would be pleasures. Things you don't like in terms of sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations. Or times when you're on an even keel, neither pleased nor displeased by the sight, sound, smell, states, tactile sensations you encounter in the course of the day. These kinds of feelings can arise pretty willy-nilly, depending on your mood, depending on your attitude. They're the kind of feelings we tend to encounter most often. As for feelings not of the flesh, these have to do with the practice. And it's right here when you begin to realize that when the Buddha is talking about feelings, he's not talking about just whatever happens to come and go. Because feelings not of the flesh have to be produced. You give rise to them. Pain not of the flesh, for instance, has to do with your desire to get the mind to be trained in concentration. As the Buddha says, when you realize that you can't get the mind to stay equanimous in the face of negative things. You should regard it as an instance of bad fortune. This does not bode well for me. <clears throat> Excuse me. This does not bode well for me. You should say to yourself that I can't bring my mind in line with the Buddha's teachings. That feeling is painful. It's not a physical feeling necessarily, but there is a mental pain that goes along with this. Why can't I get my mind to settle down? The Buddha actually encourages that kind of thinking. All too often we hear that you shouldn't try too hard in the meditation, don't set up any goals for yourself. Those are the kinds of instructions that may be appropriate for a weekend retreat when people tend to put themselves in a pressure cooker, thinking about the fact that they could have gone down to the beach instead for the weekend, but here they are in a meditation retreat, so they want something to show for it, stream entry at least. And so, of course, you place impossible goals on yourself and you make yourself miserable. So in cases like that, you should be encouraged to, to drop any idea of goals and just sort of be with the present moment. But when you're thinking about the practice as a lifetime practice, you've got to have goals and you have to have a sense of where you want to go. And one way of motivating yourself is to remind yourself you really do want to get to the, the goal. Another way of inducing pains not of the flesh is to ask us, when will I reach the awakening that those other noble ones have reached? That's an instance of pain that's actually inspiring. Now you don't stop there. Use that as motivation to develop pleasure not of the flesh, which the Buddha ranks on two levels. The first level is the level of pleasure that comes with the strong states of concentration, when your mind gets settled in with the breath. And there's a sense of ease that comes with that, sometimes even a sense of rapture, fullness, a very cool sense of well-being. That you have to give rise to. It doesn't just come willy-nilly. There may be moments of that kind of pleasure, but you want to lock in the same way that a plane locks in on a radar beam when it's going to land in an airport. You lock in with the breath and just stay right on target. And 
And there's a sense of solidity that comes with that, the Buddha says, to indulge in that sense of pleasure. Settle in and indulge in it. Another thing you hear all too often is that you should try not to get attached to concentration practice or not attached to the pleasure. It's something you should get attached to. Eventually you can wean yourself away from that attachment. But you need this kind of attachment in order to pry yourself away from other attachments that are less skillful. So it's right here you can see that pleasures and pains not of the flesh are not things you simply watch as they come or go willy-nilly. You give rise to them when necessary, because you've got to maintain this kind of pleasure. As with all skillful states, if they're not there, you try to give rise to them. When they are there, you try to develop them. Ultimately, you want to develop them to a level that the Buddha calls pleasure more not of the flesh than not of the flesh. And that, that's the pleasure that comes when you reflect on the fact that you've attained awakening. In other words, you've reached the goal. Similarly with equanimity. Equanimity not of the flesh is the equanimity that comes with the fourth jhana and then develops up through the higher formless states. That too is something you've got to induce. You don't just sit there and wait for it to hit you upside the head. You got the mind to settle in with the breath, and as the breath gets more and more refined, the energy in the body gets more and more connected. Now again, you have you have to do some connecting there. Sometimes when things settle in, it seems automatic and everything just connects. But if it doesn't, there's something you can work with. Think of all the energy channels in the body connecting up with one another, so they nourish one another. One part of the body has a little bit of excess energy, we allow it to feed other parts of the body. That's through all these multiple connections inside, which then get opened up to the pores of the skin so the energy suffuses everywhere in the body. That's when you can let the in and out breath grow more and more calm, because you're not you don't really need it that much. And you finally get to the point where you don't need it at all. This is where the mind gets really solid and really still. That's equanimity, not of the flesh. And again, that has to be induced. As for the second level, Equanimity not, more not of the flesh than not of the flesh. That refers to the equanimity you feel when you've attained awakening. You reflect on the fact that your mind is now free from defilement. This is a sense of great peace. So these things have to be in, induced. But this fits in with everything else the Buddha says on mindfulness. He talks about mindfulness as being a governing principle. If there's anything unskillful in the mind, the duty of mindfulness is to try to figure out how to get rid of it. When something skillful is developed, you try to remember to keep it going and let it develop. That's how mindfulness governs the other factors of the path. In other words, it looks at what's there in the mind and it remembers from what you've done, of what you've heard. What do you do with this particular state of mind? The mind doesn't want to settle down. What have you learned about dealing with an obstreperous mind? Either from what you've heard or what you've read or what you've done on your own in your practice. When things are going well, how do you remember to keep things well balanced? That's a much more delicate proposition, because if you think too much about them, then they begin to get wobbly. But you survey the situation, things seem to be going well, and you say, okay, just maintain this, keep this going, 
remember that this is what you want to do when things are going well. You remember to keep them going. And try to detect any ways that you make the concentration more solid, the sense of well-being more subtle. Just not just a matter of being with whatever happens to arise or whatever happens to pass away. There are certain things you want to have arise, skillful states of the mind, and you want to prevent them from passing away. As for unskillful states of mind, you want to remember to try to prevent them from arising if they are there how to get them to pass away as quickly as you can. That's mindfulness as a governing principle. And the fact that the Buddha lists feelings not of the flesh, under feelings as a frame of reference, is just an illustration of that point. Because these things don't just come or just go. And you're not here just to watch them come or go. You're here to induce them and then try to keep them going. Maintain them so they develop and grow. So ultimately you can free yourself from that pain not of the flesh. and experience nothing but the pleasure and equanimity, not of the flesh. You want to remember that that's where we're headed.